Okay. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you all so much for joining us today for the first of our Circular Pathways Knowledge Sharing webinars uh, hosted by Regenerative Waste Labs. This webinar series is part of a larger research and engagement initiative called Pathway to the Pile, Exploring Compostable Futures. And this is an initiative where we aim to advocate for the widespread use of compostable bioproducts to facilitate greater organic waste diversion from landfills. These engaging and informative webinars will take participants on a deep dive into topics pertaining to the circular bioeconomy. We'll explore the potential of organic waste streams and renewable biomass feedstocks as a tool within the circular bioeconomy. And our aim is to educate participants, drive action, and identify gaps and opportunities for policy interventions in the Canadian green economy. So I'm Dr. Lavesi Chili, Managing Owner of Regenerative Waste Labs. Regenerative Waste Labs is a Vancouver-based circular bioeconomy research and consulting firm. We're dedicated to tackling big problems and fostering systemic change within the circular bioeconomy. Our data-driven approach ensures our clients have accurate insights and actionable information for decision-making. And with a, comp a comprehensive suite of services, we help businesses to develop truly sustainable products that make a positive impact. Today, we're using Zoom tools to support our conversation. We believe that learning is a two-way street. So as much as you will learn from us, we really want to learn from you. And so we encourage active participation. Please feel free to share where you're from um, and what projects you're working on in the chat box. As we continue through the webinar, please feel free to write your thoughts in the chat box as well. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. And so you can use the raise hand function at that time to add to the discussion. And we also encourage you to write your questions in the Q&A box. Um, you can also upvote questions and we'll be sure to up answer the ones at the top of the list. The session is being recorded and registrants will have access to the recording and you'll be, uh, we'll also have a follow-up Q&A session and additional webinars to really continue the discussion of these important topics. Um, but I'd like to start, by, uh, start our discussion by centering ourselves and acknowledging the original keepers of this land. The RWL team works and plays on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. As a newcomer to Canada myself, I've thought quite deeply about what truth and reconciliation means to me. Truth means acknowledging the steps and decisions that have led our society to this point and recognizing the impact of colonialism and capitalism on cultures and ecosystems that I'm now a part of. And reconciliation means to me regeneration, regenerating both our cultures and our ecosystems, recognizing our position as stewards of the Earth's abundant resources and ensuring the equitable and responsible distribution of these. So today we come together to have this conversation from a place of compassion and generosity with the intention of improving both local and global well-being through the creation of just and equitable systems. And we're gathering here today to talk about how we can do better, exploring better ways of doing business that can cause less harm. And so it's my hope that we can continue to honor the original keepers of this land through this conversation about how we can design both products and systems that will benefit our companies, our communities, and our natural environments. So like many indigenous cultures across the world, we at RWL look to nature to inspire the approach, uh, the, the way that we approach the work that we do. When we look at regeneration of natural systems, we see that this is a process that's facilitated by an interconnected web of individuals and groups of organisms working together to make the ecosystems thrive. In the same way, RWO works to act as an innovation hub that connects stakeholders across the Canadian circular bioeconomy. We have strong partnerships with local businesses and organizations, and through this network, we facilitate the sharing of resources, information, and expertise that will grow the Canadian green economy. At RWL, we are leading the Canadian circular bioeconomy, and our mission is to create pathways for circular bioproducts. Through our research and consulting services, we support an ecosystem of innovators who are creating circular bioproducts and upcycling organic waste. We foster innovation by conducting product performance testing and environmental safety technical services. We consult for businesses and provide go-to-market support for innovators. 
We seek to redefine waste and provide education and sustainable sustainability training, as well as working with waste producers to help them find avenues to upcycle that waste. And we are passionate about driving change. And we do this by developing public education and awareness campaigns, by collaborating with stakeholders to develop standards and circular economy for, for both the circular economy and bio-based products. And we put on events like this to facilitate conversations and discussion around policy advocacy. So there's been a significant public demand and growing environmental awareness with Canadian citizens and organizations advocating for sustainable action. The urgency to address climate change and plastic pollution has been driven by international commitments such as the Paris Agreement. Here we see a timeline of the major commitments that Canada has made over the last 15 years. Canada is prioritizing these areas to demonstrate our commitment to global sustainability targets and positioning Canada as a leader in, leader in environmental stewardship. But we see that these policies are mostly around limiting greenhouse gas emissions and plastics pollution. And despite these commitments, we're still on track to exceed our net zero targets, which are the target of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to be 17% below our 2025 levels. Now, if we take a closer look at the total carbon emissions for Canada, we can start to see that it's not surprisingly where the government is focusing their efforts on the largest contributors. And we see the federal government pushing to phase out non-fossil carbon by implementing things like carbon pricing and electrifying everything that's possible. And we look at these statistics, it's understandable to see why we focus on oil and gas, transportation and buildings. However, the other components and the implications may be being overlooked. So if we now take a deeper dive into these emissions, focusing on methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas uh, global warming agent, more potent than CO2, we can actually start to see additional opportunities for reductions. Landfills contribute to around about 24% of the methane generated in Canada annually. Organic waste degrading in these environments is the main contributor to generating methane from landfills. And agriculture and, meth uh, and landfills combined are more than 50% of the methane generated. Through recycling and recovering of biomass, we see massive opportunities to go further in both chemical industries, agriculture, electricity, and fuel. The focus on net zero and plastic recycling should be part of a comprehensive strategy. The incremental steps we've taken so far have been successful. We've achieved a lot of reductions in specific areas like green buildings, and we're starting to see single-use plastics policies being implemented. The industry is now ready to build on the momentum on, of this data and these learnings. However, we can't continue to only focus on one aspect, which is greenhouse gas emissions, while overlooking other opportunities in liquid and solid waste diversion. But we see that bio, renewable biomass could help. We at the Waste Lab see the circular bioeconomy as an important next step to addressing multiple aspects of climate change and climate adaptation. We're advocating for finding avenues to generate renewable energy and renewable materials in ways that prioritize infrastructure improvements, disaster risk reduction, and community resilience Today, we're going to start to explore how we can adopt a holistic approach to waste management that includes reducing consumption, promoting circular economy models, and investing in innovative biomaterials. So today's conversation, we're going to start by defining the circular economy. We'll then move on to try to understand the different cascading uses for organic waste. We'll then be providing a framework for circular bioeconomy, which will allow us to conceptualize the circular recovery pathways that are possible, as well as identify the opportunities, gaps, and solutions within circular bioeconomy. We'll then round out our discussion talking about action and implementation, the work that stakeholders within the supply chain can, can do to build out the circular bioeconomy. And finally, at the very end of our, our webinar today, we'll have a, a ample time for question, a Q and A um, of questions from the audience. But to get started, we'll start by defining the circular bioeconomy. But to define the circular bioeconomy, we have to design, define the two core components, the first being the bioeconomy. The bioeconomy encompasses the production of renewable biological resources and the conversion of these resources into waste streams that are, uh, are value-added products such as food, 
feed, bioproducts, and bioenergy. Using green chemistry in industrial biotechnology, the bioeconomy aims to provide healthy, safe, and nutritious food, resource efficient and healthy animal feed, and new food supplements. It also will provide new chemicals and building blocks with new functionalities and properties, new bio, bioenergy and biofuels to replace fossil energy, and the development of more new and efficient sustainable bioprocessing and biorefining technologies. The bioeconomy involves all sectors and systems that rely on biological resources, from Canadian forestry to agriculture to fisheries. The circular economy is a system that maintains the value of materials for as long as possible by improving and transforming the way that goods and services are designed, manufactured and used. In this approach, products are reused, repurposed and recycled at the end of their life to minimize and prevent waste and pollution. The circular economy really aims to expand markets for recycled content, to reduce waste generation, to divert waste from landfills and incineration, to advance recycling technologies, and to create opportunities for new business models. So both of these systems address specific aspects of the challenges we face. So the bioeconomy seeks to avoid the use of fossil-based carbon by using renewable carbon. It emphasizes safe and benign products by avoiding the use of harmful chemicals and toxic byproducts. It pro provides the opportunity to make biodegradable products that can be organically recovered at the end of their life. With its focus on minimizing carbon emissions, the bioeconomy also strives to use renewable energy sources to process organic waste. The main shortcoming of the bioeconomy is that it typically does not address circularity. For example, utilizing primary biomass sources like uh, manufacturing bio-based products using things like corn and diverting that corn from the intended purpose of feeding people, which could potentially lead to food insecurities. The circular economy seeks to avoid using virgin fossil feedstocks by using recycled content. Resources are used for as long as feasible and the loss or wasting of value resource, valuable resources are pre is prevented. Unlike the bioeconomy, the circular economy has a clear focus on reusing, repurposing, and recycling products and materials. But like the bioeconomy, the circular economy also focuses on minimizing carbon emission and utilizing renewable energy sources as much as possible. The circular economy, however, focuses solely on end-of-life options and may not focus primarily on sustainable procurement or resource extraction. And although the circular economy avoids the use of virgin carbon, fossil-based carbon, it tends to focus on existing fossil-based products. And circular systems are not guaranteed to be entirely sustainable. In some cases, a circular pathway may involve greater use of resources and energy than linear pathways. The circular bioeconomy combines the best features of the bioeconomy and circular economy through a holistic approach to, bid, to bridge the gaps between and to address the shortcomings of each. Bioresources are used as a feedstock to make renewable bioproducts that are safe for people and the planet and have the highest possible added value. They're produced in a sustainable way, and this model pr prioritizes the use of materials for the most efficient and highest value purposes through upcycling wherever possible. So there are three main types of biomass that can be used within bio bioeconomy systems. Primary biomass is produced directly for specific purposes. So we can think about oranges or corn or agricultural products that are meant for consumption. We can also think about forestry products such as, such as lumber that is meant directly for construction. Secondary biomass is a byproduct of biomass production or processing. So we can think about the manure from dairy farms or grape pumice from winemaking. Tertiary biomass is obtained after use and typically has a different structure and function. So we can think about the slurry that's produced after anaerobic digestion or used cooking oil or post-consumer organic waste. There's a range of bioresources available, but the circular bioeconomy aims to utilize secondary and tertiary biomass to avoid competing with food and other primary uses of biomass. The circular bioeconomy centers the equitable distribution of surplus organic material and the utilization of unavoidable organic waste in a way that offers innovative and sustainable business models. 
So that's the circular bioeconomy in a nutshell. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about how organic waste can be upcycled in cascading uses. So first, let's take a look about at our linear value chain for organic waste. So there are a lot of different organic waste streams that can come from primary industries such as agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. And these linear systems are a little bit different to other linear systems for uh, circular economy products because of the nature of the organic feedstock, which is prone to degradation. So the value chain has the potential for a lot of wastage. So here we can start with our primary industries. And in our primary industries, we have our primary products creating residues and byproducts. And so traditionally, a lot of these waste streams have been ending up in disposal or in composting. So once we have our, our primary product that can then go into manufacture, and we can produce a lot of, manu potentially produce manufacturing waste or production waste. Those products then move into distribution. And because once again, the nature of these organic feedstocks may lead to leakages outside of that system. So we may think about, for example, a container uh, that's being traveling from one place to the other, falling off that ship and we're losing that organic material. Products can then go into the retail store. And if you're thinking about in the context of food waste, uh, if products aren't taken off the shelves fast enough, that can lead to wastage from spoilage. And then finally, we move into the use phase. And then once that product is used, we uh, end up generating our unavoidable waste. So as I mentioned, all of these can traditionally go to disposal. But there's been a lot of focus on reducing food loss and food, wa food waste, both here in Canada and globally. And there has been a transition to implementing the organic waste hierarchy. So here is a, a, a waste hierarchy that many people have most likely seen before. We start at the top where we're wanting to reduce food loss and food waste. So that may include initiatives to minimize the avoidable food waste. We can then move down into reuse where we're diverting food waste or organic waste to people and animals. We're then moving down into mechanical or biological processing. So composting organic waste to make soil amendments. And finally, down into the residuals recovery, where we're handling discards and trying to salvage materials. And at the very end of this hierarchy, which is um, not preferred, is landfill and incineration or littering. So this hierarchy is perfectly fine. We've seen it a lot multiple times. But what it misses is the many opportunities to upcycle organic waste into a circular system. So the circular bioeconomy provides opportunities to add value to organic waste streams through a concept called cascading. The goal of cascading is to increase resource efficiency and limit the demand for primary materials. And the circular bioeconomy expands the waste hierarchy to provide opportunities to divert organic waste and create value added products before the generation of bioenergy and biofuels. So let me walk you through these levels. Level one is reuse and mechanical recycling. This level emphasizes the efficient use of primary biomass resources. Mechanical recycling enables the reuse and repurposing of organic waste materials to extend their life cycle and reduce the need for new resource extraction. It contributes to the circular economy's focus on closing material loops and reducing reliance on virgin feedstocks. Mechanical recycling involves breaking down organic waste into secondary raw materials without, without significantly altering their chemical structure. So we can think about, for example, grinding shellfish shells to form an aggregate material for bioconcrete. Advanced recycling involves taking a waste product and reintroducing it into the production loop. In the context of organic waste, recycling refers to processing organic waste into, into, to create bioproducts for manufacturing. So the advanced recycling processes include chemical, biological, and advanced methods, enabling the conversion of organic waste into valuable products by extracting components and compounds from the waste material to reintroduce them back into the production cycle. Recycling renewable feedstocks derived from organic waste reduces the dependence on fossil-based resources. So there's three main ways of thinking of, of conceptualizing advanced recycling. We can do biological organic recycling, where methods such as fermentation use the power of microorganisms to harness, to transform organic waste into useful products. In chemical recycling, chemical uh, conversion or extraction processes are used to pull small molecules out of that waste to produce bio-based products. And in advanced recycling, 
It uses a combination of biochemical, thermochemical processes that employ heat, pressure, catalysts, and solvents to break down organic waste. And all of these processes generate materials like acids, alcohols, and bioactive compounds, things like chitosan being extracted from shellfish shells or cellulose being extracted from wood, making compounds that can be then fed back into the chemical cycle. And finally, at level three, we have carbon recovery. So recovery involves taking a waste product and recovering what's useful to be indirectly fed back into the loop. And so by indirectly, indirect feeding into the loop means things like energy generation or compost production. So not creating molecules which are going to be directly used in production. So energy recovery means taking biomass and converting that into a renewable energy source. So that could be things like biofuels, biogas, and biochar. Organic recovery is where we take that biomass and convert it into a product that has ecological benefits like compost or biofertilizers. So here we have three different levels of cascading which can extract higher value from organic waste uh, and, and, and allow that waste to be diverted from disposal methods. So now we've gone through at a high level the goals of the circular bioeconomy and the pathways for upcycling organic waste. However, to understand the system of just distributing, processing, and recovering organic waste, we need to understand the complex interactions within the circular bioeconomy and the key aspects which can shape the dynamics and outcomes of this system. So to help conceptualize these concepts, we have found a recent article from authors Donner and Vries. The, these researchers have described the interactions within the circular bioeconomy in the context of a game. I really liked this analogy because one, it's fun. Um, I love board games as much as the next person, but it also emphasizes the collaborative nature of this system and also how cooperation and competition can exist in a way that drives sustainable outcomes. So when we start this game, we start with a playing field. And so the playing field represents the environment in which the game unfolds. The field is the place where the circular bioeconomy systems can be implemented. So this can include different geographical regions like rural areas or urban spaces or even the interface where those two areas meet. And so we can think about the playing field as the cradle that provides the resources needed to play the game. Next, we can picture a diverse group of players representing both public and private organizations and individuals involved in the circular bioeconomy. So these players can form partnerships ranging from public-private partnerships to cooperatives to industrial clusters. So we can think about the potential of a, a cooperative of cideries that are coming together to create a marketplace for the apple pumice that they produce. Or a regional government who has trees which may be affected by the hemlock looper, which is kind of killing trees here in BC. And so that regional government is setting up a partnership with vendors who can process this wood waste. Or it can be an individual like a waste hauler who's stepping into the role of becoming an organic waste distrib distributor. So each of these players brings unique skills and resources to the game, and by working together, they can create new business models within the circular bioeconomy. The resources themselves are the game pieces. These resources are generated within the playing field. The pieces could be things like agricultural residues like manure or animal carcasses, or byproducts from the agri-food supply chain, like spent brewery grain. They can also be kind of next level bio-waste resources, like hair clippings from a cooperative of hair salons, or dog fur from a dog groomer. So these pieces are all moved around strategically as the different players are making their moves. So the rules of this game are driven by the enablers and barriers of the system. So these rules determine the steps that a player or a new business model can take within the circular bioeconomy. So these rules could be things like new laws which restrict the import of virgin plastic resins or renewable content regulations or tax incentives for co-locating within an industrial cluster. We can think of these as the guiding principles that govern the game. So when players come together and start to make their moves, the players make moves by innovating in the way that they organize themselves and the technologies that they use. The moves in this context could include the production of a waste stream, like a, like a restaurant who's generating used cooking oil, or the distribution of waste, so a company collecting and pre-treating organic waste so it can be more readily transported into the marketplace, 
or recycling, a company that's purchasing waste and extracting value-added components from it. These moves can include production, processing, distribution, consumption, and also the promotion of sustainable practices as well. So as the players make moves and create the circular bioeconomy, they create new and valuable products. These products could be biofuels, biofertilizers, biomaterials, or a host of other bio-based products. These innovative creations add excitement and value to the game. But each move also has a consequence. And ultimately, the outcomes of the game can either be sustainable or unsustainable. And if the outcomes are unsustainable, it prompts the players to reflect on the necessary adaptations that will ensure future sustainable outcomes. So perhaps a vineyard realizes that they themselves don't have a sustainable flow of grape punnets to supply the industry. So they decide to form a cooperative with other vineyards in their region to ensure that the marketplace and innovators have a stable supply of this feedstock so that they can use. Or perhaps there's a disaster like a hurricane which happened in Nova Scotia, which creates a whole new waste stream. And so a municipality now has to uh, create new partnerships to find ways to deal with that waste stream. The game's dynamics emerge through a series of adaptations over time in a way that showcases the interconnectedness of these different and emerging business models. And so this is where feedback and feed forward loops come into play to create these loops to really understand the interconnections within this complex and evolving system. But just like any game, the circular bioeconomy game requires players to think strategically, to consider their moves carefully, and to adapt their strategies over time. And by understanding the rules and collaborating with others and making very innovative moves, players can contribute to uh, creating a sustainable and thriving circular bioeconomy system. So we've introduced this framework to provide context and context that will allow us to continue to explore the nuances of the circular bioeconomy. We'll look now at some examples of circular recovery pathways through the lens of different potential players within the circular bioeconomy. So we'll look at some ideas of cascading in action. In this example, we're going to be taking agricultural residues to make a reusable container. So the players in this game is a collaborative partnership between a wheat farm cooperative and a company producing biopolymers from agricultural waste. The farmer produces wheat straw that's generated after harvest and sells this to the biocomposite producer. So this is a level two cascading loop where the biocomposite producer is now creating biopolymers through biological recycling. The biopolymers are then molded into various shapes, including reusable containers like food trays. Those are then distributed, retailed, and used. So once the containers are made, the farmer's cooperative is no longer directly involved in the high-level cascading cycles, but the biocomposite producer has formed a relationship with their value chain to ensure that the material will eventually find its way back to them. However, until then, the reusable containers can be maintained within a reuse repair loop for as long as feasibly possible. Eventually, all containers will lose their mechanical properties, and at this point, they fall into another level one cascade, which is mechanical recycling. The material can be returned to the biocomposite producer, who will shred and reprocess that material into new biocomposite products, such as new containers, and then these new materials will then feed back into the loop again, reducing the amount of virgin materials needed for production. But everything eventually has an end of life. So when that biocomposite eventually reaches its end of life and can be no longer re recycled, the biocomposite producer can then facilitate the organic recovery of that material through composting. It has been designed to be chipped at the end of its life, and so after composting, that material can then be uh, broken down to provide an agricultural supplement that can be provided back to the farming cooperative. So in this example, the value of the initial wheat waste is maintained through many cascading cycles within a very collaborative value chain. So in our next example, we're going to look at construction wood waste. So in this example, we're going to focus on one specific player, a deconstruction company who's seeking to maximize the value of the materials that they obtain. So wood waste is used in buildings and, and different structures. 
And because of the supportive municipal bylaws, all buildings in a region must be deconstructed rather than demolished. This provides a stream of wood and wood residues with varying uses. So the highest quality wood can be used in a level one cascade where the wood is reused directly into new homes. And then the remaining wood can be re mechanically recycled into engineered wood products like particle board. So when all the higher quality wood has been inputted into reuse and recycling systems, the rest of the wood, perhaps rotted wood or wood damage or water damaged wood, can enter a level two cascade. In this loop, the wood waste undergoes chemical and biological treatment to extract products like cellulose and lignin. So these chemical feedstocks can then be sold back into the production loop because cellulose and lignin are valuable feedstocks that, that can be used to produce a variety of products, including things like carbon fiber and textiles. So what remains maybe chemically treated wood or wood fractions, which is too small to be to make much sense of using. In this case, the material can enter a level three cascade of recovery. Here, it's further processed using thermochemical conversion like pyrolysis, which is heating in the absence of oxygen, to generate biochar and biofuels. So in this scenario, the biofuels can be utilized indirectly for heat and power, either for manufacturing or transportation. And then the biochar can be used as, a, as an input for agricultural use as a soil amendment. So this example really showcases the value of a multi-stage cascade in both reducing the amount of virgin raw materials that are needed, but also in increasing resource efficiency and upcycling waste in multiple ways to create multiple different revenue streams. So those are two examples of individual organizations and collaborations which could emerge out of the circular bioeconomy. At RWL, we, have, we are lucky enough to be working with innovators who are seeking to understand how they can tie into this new economy. So we're going to now explore some of the gaps and opportunities that these stakeholders are facing and identify mechanisms to overcome them. So in a recent study by Salvador and their colleagues, they interviewed 32 companies and asked them to consider the opportunities and gaps within the circular bioeconomy. So this graph just shows the opportunities which were identified. These are aspects or situations that are already in place and can be taken advantage of to enable circular bioeconomy practices. We have the valorization of bioresources, the value recovery and waste recovery were the most highly mentioned opportunities for businesses. And each of these opportunities really focuses on upcycling organic waste, which may previously have been diverted to landfill or to compost. Through our work, we see tangible real-world examples of businesses actioning upon these opportunities. And I'm gonna share some of those with you today. So waste recovery really involves upcycling bio-waste. So this bio-waste could be things like food waste, the organic fraction of municipal solid waste, animal manure, and other bio-waste into value-added products. And these products could be things like biofuels, organic fertilizers, or a host of other different things. So one Canadian innovator has established a high throughput insect farm that produces large quantities of manure. They were faced with a significant business risk for how to manage this waste stream using traditional methods like composting or landfilling. However, they saw that there was also a significant opportunity to diversify the different uses for their manure into a variety of different agricultural products from compost to liquid fertilizers to animal feed. They were able to optimize their waste recovery strategies to turn the significant costs of dealing with high volumes of organic waste into multiple revenue streams. The organic fraction of municipal solid waste is inherently contaminated and is often sent to landfill. One company that we know of in Nova Scotia has developed an integrated facility to remove contamination and generate biochar. So this company takes the municipal solid waste they separate the contamination of metal and plastics, and those are diverted to recycling facilities. And the organic waste is directly valorized through a thermo thermochemical process to make biochar. 
And through this process, they've been able to divert contaminated organic waste from the landfill while generating multiple high value products in, with, yeah, from both the recycled plastics, recycled metals, and the biochar from the organic waste. Some other examples include uh, are focused on valorization or, way, or value recovery. So valorization is targeting products with the highest possible value. So biomass reaches its maximum value when it's used for things like fine chemicals that feed into health or lifestyle applications. So we can think about pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, and nutraceuticals. These uses are usually vastly more profitable than things like animal feed, compost, or even biofuels. So organic waste, which is very well defined in composition, are prime targets for high valorization because Innovators can be sure of the consistent chemical composition compared to things like mixed municipal waste, which might have multiple different components within it. One business in British Columbia has been creating their product for many years, and they do it well, with a very highly, highly efficient operations and a very well-defined waste stream. They recently were very interested in finding ways to further reduce the impact of waste on their operations and the potential to turn this into a revenue stream. So we've worked with them to identify the highest possible value for their waste stream, which was found to be in pharmaceuticals. So with this positive value proposition, our clients are now exploring the feasibility of biochemical recycling technologies for their facility so that they can access this additional revenue stream from their waste. Another client we're working with is seeing the writing on the wall and that, that businesses are starting to explore the value in their organic waste streams. However, one significant challenge that businesses with waste face is that the transportation of wet, dense organic waste means that it doesn't always end up at the destination in the appropriate condition. So this company is developing pre-treatment technologies to facilitate the distribution of waste and support businesses in creating circular loops for that waste. So we work directly with many small to medium businesses here in Canada who are utilizing waste feedstocks to make their bio-based products. There are many companies across Canada with innovations that are currently making significant progress in advancing the circular bioeconomy. But we know that for as many of successful businesses there are, there are many, many more facing significant challenges in participating in this system. So when we talk about the opportunities, we also have to talk about the barriers, the forces in place which are preventing the imp implementation of circular bioeconomy practices. So what this 2020 study also highlighted was that there were two overarching barriers to implementing circular bioeconomy systems, inade inadequate regulation and the lack of financial support. The biggest gaps of funding and regulation often go hand in hand when new industries are being developed. Investors are waiting to see a clear regulatory framework to de-risk the innovation pipeline. And we have many clients who are producing things like compostable products who are currently feeling this challenge firsthand. So participate, participants in this 2020 study also identified what can be considered as secondary barriers, transportation and, logis and logistics of organic waste, infrastructure and storage of that waste, and knowledge on different valorization pathways, as well as the market demand. These secondary barriers tie into the business opportunities within the circular bioeconomy. So if we go back and think about the context of our circular bioeconomy game, by understanding these barriers, we can start to design effective rules for the game, which will allow players to engage more fully in the circular bioeconomy. So the rules and enablers provide mechanisms in which policy can intervene and drive both demand and supply of organic waste streams. So what we see here in Canada is regulators implementing programs to facilitate the greater diversion of waste from landfills into a circular economy that reuses, recycles, and composts waste. However, if these policies towards landfill diversions are not also coupled with supporting infrastructure for cascading uses, they will be largely ineffective. So some potential enablers to intervene in the system would be to see alongside the regulations that we're currently seeing around the minimum recycled content would also be regulations to support the inclusion of renewable content. 
So having regulations that support renewable content in our products will reduce the risk associated with investing and developing new technologies and new products and marketplaces here in Canada. This, this work will also be aligned with the, uh, the overarching um, Canadian initiatives to reduce uh, GHG emissions. And it will also promote the valorization of waste into products and feedstocks. So some other examples come from the challenge that our clients face who are developing compostable products. So these products fall into a category of products for which compostability makes sense. They're short-term applications. Recycling is not feasible because it's not practical to separate organic waste from the products themselves. And compostable alternatives are feasible. So when we look at landfill data, this specifically tells the story of cleaning, sanitary, hygiene, pet care products, which should be diverted from landfill if there were compostable alternatives. So once again, we're seeing regulators seeking to divert organics from the landfill, but we're also seeing businesses who are innovating compostable bioproduct alternatives. So at the moment, we're seeing that municipalities and compost acceptance of these products is practically negligible across the country. And this is because municipal regulators are facing a supply shortage of compost operators who are able to process this diversity of organic waste streams. So some potential enablers to intervene and enable this participation will be to look at the province, provincial composting permits. So at the moment, most provinces distinguish three classes of composting, leaf and yard waste, food waste, and biosolids. But by expanding these classes to include a category for compostable products, this will allow standard conditions and reporting requirements for those specific operators who do wish to take these products. It will provide a mechanism for municipalities to ensure that their vendors, their waste vendors can actually process compostable products. And it will actually start to create a level playing field comp for compostable products compared to other types of um, uh, like uh, petroleum based products as well, because there is an end of life stream for them. And so this is the opportunity of the circular bioeconomy by taking a holistic approach and advocating for a balanced policy framework. The circular bioeconomy can really be the binder that supports the various Canadian commitments aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions while also developing an industry that has green jobs and improves the resilience of our production supply chains in the face of climate change. So implementing a circular bioeconomy will mean prioritizing the use of renewable and recycled carbon. It will provide safe and benign products into the marketplace, and it will allow for reuse, recycling, and organic recovery pathways. And also will help to produce more widespread production of renewable energy sources. So we're coming up to the end of our uh, uh, the presentation part of our uh, the present presentation part of our webinar, um, and so we'll before we open for questions, so please feel free to drop your questions in the Q and A box. We're going to start to look at ways take this. We're going to come back to this idea of the circular bioeconomy and explore ways how we as stakeholders can facilitate action and the implementation of this system. So let's go back to this idea of the game. So when we're building the game of the circular bioeconomy, each stakeholder from business leaders and investors to innovators, policymakers, and sustainability advocates has a very unique role to play. Business leaders have the ability to invest in sustainable procurement by offering products which have a lower environmental impacts compared to traditional products. Seeking out opportunities to incorporate bio-based resources will drive market demand as well as market supply. And working within collaborative networks will ease the risk of commercializing new technologies. For example, working within a cooperative of waste producers will allow a stabilized uh, supply for, for innovators to be able to actually use those materials. And keep in mind that even eliminating the cost of managing waste might lead to a compelling financial case for your own business or the businesses that you may want to partner with. Be sure to collaborate with policymakers to shape regulations and encourage sustainable practices and embrace a culture of continuous improvement and implementing feedback loops to support sustainable growth. We have a lot of innovators on the call today. Innovators are those who are creating new technologies and putting them into the marketplace. Remember that waste is a bioresource that can have some of the lowest environmental impacts. 
Conduct research and assessments to identify what biomass resources might be able to be used in your product. Think about their characteristics and the potential applications. Explore ways to create innovative technologies and processes that will be able to convert and valorize organic waste. Develop and implement business models that embrace circularity and start to foster collaborations with stakeholders within your value chain to form integrated and sustainable value chains. Policymakers have a critical role in developing public policies that will enable a circular bioeconomy, both on the demand and the supply side. We can think about creating supportive policies and regulatory frameworks that incentivize the efficient use and sustainable use of biomass, feeds, uh, biomass resources. Thinking about how we might be able to facilitate using relatively simple policy interventions to facilitate the actual reuse of those materials. And also in, in understanding, taking a deep dive to understand these different systems in more detail. Policymakers can also facilitate collaboration between stakeholders and establish platforms for knowledge sharing and collaboration. And I think the one thing which was highlighted in, in the different reports that we've highlighted today is that support and investment in these initiatives will really help to uh, build the circular bioeconomy and promote the development of these the infrastructure and supply chains that are needed to circulate biomass resources. And finally, the sustainability advocate. The advocate is able to engage with various stakeholders to raise awareness about the circular bioeconomy, its benefits and the importance of these sustainable practices. The advocate identifies obstacles that are hindering the transition to a circular bioeconomy and works to remove them. Advocates support new uh, policy interventions, funding mechanisms and, 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 and encourages uh, and encourage sustainable practices. And sustainability advocates can also support research and development efforts uh, to enhance sustainability and resource efficiency. So Regenerative Waste Labs is uniquely positioned to be an advocate. We don't produce biomaterials, we just test them. We, we consult on waste recovery technologies, but we don't produce those either. Through our position in the marketplace, we have a vested interest to support Canadian innovation and small businesses, and we are providing an opportunity for all stakeholders to lean in and drive action within the circular bioeconomy. We have identified a series of barriers that are limiting the widespread use of compostable bioproducts. And these bioproducts could facilitate greater diversion from landfill. And so despite the validated performance of Canadian businesses, the absence of uh, sustainable infrastructure to handle compostables, uh, the fact that compostables and compostable products are designed defined as those which divert food waste, not organic waste from the landfill, and also that certain compostable products cannot be certified compostable because they are not considered to be food related. So these are main barriers to implementing more compostable bio-based alternatives in our marketplace today. So we've repeatedly seen and witnessed these gaps and innovators are coming to us again and again, highlighting these challenges. And so we know that without collaborative targeted action, there's a very low probability of actually addressing the challenges of accepting compostable bioproducts. So this is why we're here today. This is the first of our knowledge sharing webinars that's part of a collaborative research and engagement product project. We saw this gap that was hindering the transition to the circular bioeconomy, and we're working towards removing this, these, these challenges by educating, advocating, and providing research mechanisms to encourage sustainable practices. And we're inviting everyone who's participating on the call today to be part of this important action. So our project is called Pathway to the Pile Compostable Futures, and there's two parts to this project. Our engagement project is really about uh, knowledge, knowledge sharing and creating case uh, and sharing um, case studies and examples of success. So the first part of this is these knowledge sharing webinars. In follow-up webinars, we'll be talking about aggregate data and aggregate analysis that we've done of waste data from landfills. We'll also be identifying ideal use cases for compostable bioproducts alternatives. And we'll also be doing webinars to showcase the actionable steps that can be taken to advance and drive the acceptance of compostable bioproducts. We'll also be facilitating stakeholder roundtables. This will be an inclusive platform for collaboration. We'll be seeking uh, participation from people in the audience today and their networks to gather diverse perspectives on key aspects related to the development of compostable bioproducts. This will enable stakeholders from different sectors to share their insights, identify challenges, and collectively explore solutions. 
This will be an opportunity to really collaborate with other stakeholders to make informed decisions and embrace compostable alternatives. The other project we have is a research project. So within our dedicated research site that we're setting up at the, at, within the city of Vancouver's zero waste demonstration site, we're going to be evaluating the performance and environmental impacts of compostable products. We'll be exploring the feasibility of different composting methods to process compostables, things like bunker static piles, home composting methods, as well as innovations in in-vessel composting and benchtop composting systems. We'll be ensuring that we're coupling this testing with uh, testing for pathogens and chemicals of concern to make sure that these products are safe for people and the planet. And this is an opportunity to join a platform of researchers, policymakers, and the public to observe the composting process, to engage in discussions, and really witness the positive outcomes that compostable materials can, can have in a real-world setting. So we are inviting you to participate in sharing best practices and innovative solutions and success stories. Um, you can certainly reach out to our team, both in the chat box and uh, via email, to, to learn more about this partnership opportunity. So that wraps up our, uh, our presentation for today, but just to go through some of the main points that we've, that we've covered. There's so much potential within the circular bioeconomy, and by taking a step back and implementing a more balanced approach, which doesn't just focus on reaching net zero, we can open more opportunities to build greater resilience within our communities through the development of new business models. We also talked about implementation of circular cascading systems for biomass and how the circular bioeconomy will prioritize both reuse, renewable and recyclable carbon, will prioritize safe and benign products, and open up a variety of different recovery pathways for organic waste, whilst facilitating the development of more, uh, more infrastructure for renewable energy. And finally, we talked about the game of the circular bioeconomy, how implementing the circular bioeconomy is complex, but can be expressed and thought about in the simple context of this game. And within this context, there's many collaborations and moves that you can make to really achieve sustainable outcomes. And that by understanding the barriers to the circular bioeconomy, we can start to develop policies that will enable and set the rules for our game so that we can reach a successful, uh, a successful future. So that concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. I'll now open the floor up to questions from the audience. So please feel free to raise your hand if you would like, um, or you can ask, I'll, uh, start with some questions from the chat box. Um, so I wanted to share with you the upcoming webinars that we have um, uh, from Regenerative Waste Labs. So we will be doing a follow-up question and answer period for this specific webinar um, on August 9th, um, which I believe is the right date. Um, and we'll also be doing another webinar in September called uh, Compostable Alternatives Driving Climate Action Through Landfill Diversion. So here we'll be sharing some of the research that we've done um, exploring landfill data from across uh, Canada and really highlighting the opportunities for compostable alternatives to start to drive landfill diversion of various um, organics contaminated waste streams. Uh, in November of this year, we'll be uh, doing another webinar called Rethinking Governance and Technology for Sustainable Organic Waste Management. We'll be, starting, we'll be taking a deep dive into different types of technologies that are available in the marketplace today for the um, conversion, uh, cascading conversion of organic waste. And so that'd be a great opportunity for those who are interested in seeing new types of technologies that are in the marketplace. And early next year, we'll be uh, doing another webinar called Bridging the Gaps, Actionable Steps to Drive Acceptance of Compostable Bioproducts. Uh, so this will be um, a webinar to talk about some of the results from our roundtable discussions around compostables. So it'll be a great opportunity for the participants to be engaged um, in that conversation as well. And you can feel free to visit the RWR website for more details about these different webinars, as well as access to some of the resources that we have available um, from market summaries to uh, web and, um, presentations on uh, updates on the Canadian landscape for, for uh, organics, Canadian landscape for circular bioeconomy. Um, and you can feel free to reach out to our team uh, for more information on our Pathway to the Pile Exploring Compostable Futures um, project. So thank you all so much for joining the conversation today. Uh, after this Zoom webinar, we will, uh, you'll 
see um, a, a short survey, a post-webinar survey, which we would really encourage everybody to participate in so that we can get some feedback on how, um, how to improve on our webinars and some additional topics which might be of interest to our community for us to be sharing. So thank you so much, um, and I hope you all enjoyed the rest of your day.